Let me first talk about fluoride in general and give you an idea in overall terms what fluoridation of public water supplies is doing to the people of the United States right now. We're chronically poisoning over 150 million Americans by means of fluoridation of public water supplies. 25 million of them have been so badly poisoned that you can see white chalky areas on their teeth. This is the first symptom of fluoride poisoning called dental fluorosis. A large number of the 40 million arthritics in this country are due, are suffering from arthritis as a result of fluoride in the water supply. We have about 2 million people who are allergic or experience hypersensitive reactions to fluoride. Uh, we have about 35,000, an estimated 35,000 deaths a year, that's 100 deaths a day, due to fluoridation of public water supplies. And over 10,000 of those 30,000, 35,000, are due to the effect of fluoride in inducing cancer and cancer death. Uh, that's an overall viewpoint. I won't be able to go into the biochemistry of all of this, but uh, since my t subject is fluoridation and cancer, I'll go into that. First of all, uh, how many people here know what an enzyme is? Anybody? Can somebody give me an answer? What is an enzyme? It's a protein. What else? It's a catalyst. What it does is it facilitates reactions in our body that make life possible. In other words, in our body we can burn sugar, which normally would require hundreds and hundreds of degrees to burn. We can burn it at 98.6 degrees centigrade. It's responsible, these enzymes are responsible for the breakdown of foods, release of calories and energy, the buildup of cell components, the breakdown of older cell components, responsible for rejuvenation, uh, responsible for repair of our body, responsible for excretion of waste products from our body. Virtually everything in our body is under physiological control of these very important proteins called enzymes. Now, fluoride inhibits, at one part per million, fluoride inhibits over 10 that we know of and probably well in it, and we're talking about the amount that's used to fluoride in public water supplies, an estimated 100 or more other enzymes. One of the most important enzymes <clears throat> with regard to cancer is an enzyme system called the DNA repair enzyme system. This enzyme system exists in the nucleus or the nuclei of every one of the cells in our body with the exception of red blood cells which don't have a nucleus. But every cell that has a nucleus in our body and has genetic material has a DNA repair enzyme system. One part per million fluoride, which is the amount they add to public water supplies, inhibits this enzyme system by 50%. Now, the importance of this is that if we're taking a walk out in the sun and ultraviolet light falls on our skin, if we take something in our diet that happens to cause chromosomal damage or might cause cancer, we have the ability within each one of our cells to repair the damage done and that ability is reduced by 50% just by drinking fluoridated water. Now, in addition to that, I would say there are about close to 40 papers showing that fluoride at levels down to and including the amount used to fluoridate public water supplies causes genetic damage. The effects of genetic damage can be varied. The cell can die, which is probably the best thing that could happen because you no longer have that cell to deal with. It's not going to become a cancer cell. It's not going to put bad things into the person's body. Or it can make that cell become toxic, which means that by means of damaging one of the regulatory sites on that genetic material, enzymes will be produced that will crank out substances which are toxic to the body, leading to degenerative diseases. And this is what happens in the, in the case of dental fluorosis and arthritis uh, as a result of fluoride's effect. What also can happen if, if this genetic damage occurs in a sperm cell or an egg cell and can lead to birth defects. And the horrible thing about these birth defects is they will be carried on from generation to generation to generation. These pieces of damage that fluoride does to our genetics become permanent. And as long as that cell line continues, that flaw will continue for generation upon generation, even if none of the future generations even drink fluoridated water. And then finally, 
if fluoride causes damage at the part of the genetic material which controls cell growth, you have a break and no longer will that cell be able to have its growth controlled and it will result in a tumor. And if the tumor excretes proteolytic enzymes to digest away other cells, it becomes a malignant tumor or what we refer to as cancer. Now in 1963, as early as 1963, doctors Herskowitz and Norton found, and by the way, Dr. Herskowitz is a well-known geneticist. He's published nine textbooks on genetics. He and his co-worker, Dr. Norton, found that as they increased fluoride in the medium of their animals, they could increase tumor incidence from 12 to 100 percent. In other words, they could induce tumors in 100 percent of their animals. In 1963, in 1965, doctors Taylor and Taylor from the University of Texas at Austin, at the Clayton Biochemical Research Institute, that's where Roger Williams is from, found that one part per million in the water of fluoride increased tumor growth rate by 25 percent. Now before I go into explaining why this happened, let me also explain that fluoride at one part per million inhibits the immune system by from 30 to 70 percent. So by means of destroying our genetic repair system, we've destroyed in large part, or impaired in large part, our primary defense mechanism against cancer. And now we've destroyed a large part of the immune system. We have now destroyed the secondary defense mechanism, which is the immune system. And this is exactly what Taylor and Taylor found out, that they would inject a small amount of cancer cells have one part of their animals drink non-fluoridated water, the other drink fluoridated water, and tumor growth rate would be enhanced by 25 percent because the immune system could no longer effectively or as effectively hold back the tumor growth rate. That was in 1965. In the 70s, a number of studies come, came out showing additional work from Columbia University, from University of Missouri, showing genetic damage from, can from fluoride, and then in 1974 and 1975, Dr. Dean Burke, who was the former chief chemist of the National Cancer Institute, and by the way, one of the recipients of Cancer Control Society's Humanitarian Award, and myself, started studies which showed that we could find, and we did find, after very extensive epidemiological studies, over 10,000 excess cancer deaths in areas that were fluoridated as compared to those that were not fluoridated. We looked at somewhere in the order, well over a million cancer deaths, and looked before fluoridation in either group of cities occurred, no difference in cancer re death rate or death rate trends. Shortly after, within two or three to five years after fluoridation, a marked divergence with the fluoridated city's cancer death rate going up substantially. We corrected for various variables such as age, race, and sex of the population, and found and confirmed. And in three out of four court cases in this country proved by a preponderance of the evidence that fluoridation caused chronic toxic effects, genetic damage, and cancer. And these cases were heard between 1978 and 1982. The decisions came out, and we'll talk about the politics later on. But we were able to prove by a preponderance of the evidence. And we had, we had people from the National Cancer Institute, uh, National Academy of Sciences, Royal Statistical Society, Royal College of Physicians coming in against us. And the Judges in these cases gave overwhelming, overwhelming support to the fact that we were able to show the link and no one could question it. In 1977, Congress held hearings, two days of hearings on the work of Dr. Burke and myself, and at that time instigated with the National Toxicology Program. By the way, if this whole thing, the whole, when our studies were coming out, the National Cancer Institute was making bogus claims that our studies didn't make certain corrections. During the congressional hearings, it was found that the National Cancer Institute, along with the Royal College of Physicians and Royal Statistical Society, were involved in the conspiracy and actually published as independent studies data that was erroneous and supplied by our own U.S. National Cancer Institute to the British workers. This was brought out in the hearings and they said, we can no longer go with this. We're telling the National Cancer Institute to go back 
do additional research, and three years from now, 1980, we want studies on animal studies to find out whether fluoride causes cancer or not. I was supposed to be on the protocol committee. <laughs> I never was. 1980, no results came out. In 1982, we found they were starting their studies. In 1984, 85, they said the studies didn't come out right, so we have to redo them. But in the meantime, in Japan in 1984, a group of uh, investigators headed by Dr. Tsutsui found they could transform normal cells into cancer cells merely by exposure of these cells to fluoride. And it occurred within a matter of days because they used slightly higher concentrations. They used 30 parts per million instead of one part per million. And uh, the uh, National Cancer Institute was still working away on their so-called studies. In 1988, Argonne National Laboratories, which is one of the most prestigious laboratories in the country, confirmed the Japanese work, which is published in Cancer Research, and stated not only did we find that fluoride caused cancer, but also that it stimulated cancer caused by other cancer-causing substances, published in 1988. Finally, we got leaks from Battelle Memorial Institute, which was doing the study for the U.S. Public Health Service. And those leaks were, first, that fluoride appeared to be, at least in male rats, responsible for an increase in bone cancer. And then after that, in getting Battelle's data, we found that fluoride was definitely linked to a rare form of liver cancer called hepatocholangiocarcinoma. Never occurs in untreated animals only when carcinogens are given. And as the fluoride concentration went up, this rare form of liver cancer went up. Never reported, except we have the data now from Battelle. And we also found in male and female rats an increase in oral tumors and cancers as the fluoride concentration went up. In 1990, this hit the press. And uh, there was, you know, equivocal link between fluoride and bone cancer, but none of the most important cancers were mentioned. And because this concerned our friends of the Public Health Service who had been promoting fluoridation since 1950, Dr. James Mason, who is notorious for making fraudulent statements in the area of fluoridation anyhow, called, and by the way, he's your top health officer right now. I remember one time a congressman asked about Dean Burke, uh, is it true that Dean Burke is an uh, uh, eminent chemist at the National Cancer Institute. He said, no, he worked for the Canadian National Cancer Institute. And it took a threat by Dean Burke of a suit against Mason to make him admit that Dean Burke did work for the National Cancer Institute of the United States. And he is now your top health officer. He is Undersecretary of Health for Health and Human Services. Now, I've heard people at these lectures say, Cooperate with the National Cancer Institute. Cooperate with the U.S. Public Health Service. Let me tell you, the people in charge, in my opinion, are absolutely corrupt. You cannot trust them, ladies and gentlemen. They're in bed with some evil elements, and I don't know all the ramifications. But you cannot, you cannot expect a fair shake from these people. <clears throat>